Can you hear me well? Awesome. Uh, so, hi everyone. Um, my name is Adam Shemalik, and I'm a software engineer in Red Hat, Federal Contributor, and I just want to tell you something about Agile. But before I start, I have a caution. I'm an engineer, so like whatever I say it might not be the truth, but this will be useful things, or at least things I think are useful, and that's basically it. So let's let's start. So there is the <laughs> so what is agile? It's 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 mostly compared to a traditional approach, and the traditional approach is basically like a software development, right? You would have some requirements, you would do the design, implementation, testing, deployment, there will be some consequences like maintenance and stuff like this and bug fixes. And you just like do it in one go and then it's done. And what this Agile is basically about is that you do iterations. So you try, you feedback and fail, try, feedback, fail. And you do these reviews and Basically, you somehow iterate to the right place, and it's much easier to plan, much much easier to to manage, basically. And so, how the work is defined in in the traditional. So you basically get a specification as a developer, right? And you just like do it. Or you could have an issue tracker if you're an open source community, and then you just like everything you want to do. But what I see in Agile and I don't know if that's true, but basically what I see is these three things. So there are goals, actions, and feedback. And the goals would be things that you want to produce. So this is like the end result, right? So when we were doing the documentation, we had things like translation, build pipeline, information architecture. And then we have some actions, which are basically units of work how to get to that goals. So we just like push this into this Git repo, right? This script and you would somehow get closer. And then there is the third thing, which is feedback. And that's what just comes from your users. And they are represented in these things. So the goals are named epics, or usually called epics. At least that's how I use them. Actions could be represented as a cards and issues. And feedback is the issue. So that's what you get, for example, in your issue tracker, right? And I think these are three separate things and some open source project would only use the issue tracker, which is, I think, fine, but it might be harder, at least from my perspective, for onboarding new people, understanding of what's going on, because it would be messy, right? You would have your user feedback there, you would have your RFEs, you would have things that you need to do of various sizes or the goals, and it would be somehow, like, crazy, and probably could manage with tags or everything, but I think having, having these three groups of things can, can, can really help. And it would look like, look like this if you structure it. So you could have epics as, as the goals and then you would have like the units of work how to get closer to that goal, right? And then the issues from, from your user. And there are basically two methodologies I know of or I have experience with. Um, how you can approach working on those on those tasks and goals. So Scrum and Kanban. And the difference is that Scrum is about sprints. I say it's about planning and commitment and iteration. So what that means, you would basically choose cards that you want to make, and there would be a time period like two weeks, and it would do like two weeks cycle, for example, and you would commit to do this this set of set of issues and in the end you would see the end result and then you could decide is that enough or do we need another or is it just like a completely different path right so this is more about those cycles and Kanban on the other hand is lean continuous prioritizing so you would have a list of those cards and you would prioritize them in the way in, in, in a certain way and they would just take either one by one just like slowly progressing there wouldn't be any cycles, any planning, and you would just like slowly go through the through the queue and prioritizing on the way. So these are the two main approaches, and I'll just explain them a little bit more with activities. So what do you do if if you want to do this, or at least 
what we did, what we did in the teams I worked with. So I, I think there are major five different activities. So something is called grooming, then it's planning, stand up, retrospective, and demo. And I know there may be some new words. And also, not all apply to all to those two principles. So, for example, Scrum uses basically all of them, but Kanban just some of them. So let, let's let's have a look what that is. So grooming is basically about creating, defining, clarifying, and prioritizing those cards. So this is where your team or a group of people can sit and basically define what they want to do. So you could define the epics, your goals, as, as I said, for example, for the documentation translation or something. And then you could see the cards, which would be the work you want to do to get closer. And Having this scope, like in these small pieces, is much much easier for you, I guess, to to focus on like a separate part, right? And you, you can see like you could do even reviews of what you've already done, and basically make like organize your board with these things. And by the way, I will be showing a live demo in the end of how we use it in the docs project. I haven't set up before, so yeah. But that's basically grooming, making sense in the cards and making sure it's updated and it makes sense that there's everything. Then you could do planning, but this is just in the Scrum. As I said, Scrum is doing like cycles, for example, two-week cycles, and you need to plan what you want to commit for those cycles. So we, for example, you say you want to complete these 10 cards in this point, and then you just do your work. Kanban doesn't have it because there's no planning, there's no cycles, you just like go through these. So that, that's one activity. And you mostly work, work on, only on those cards and just completing what you, what you planned. One of the nice things about this is daily stand-up. So this is, oh, daily. It, it doesn't need to be daily, but we, use, we usually did daily. And it was just like the same between the people, what we did, what we planned to do this day, today. And just, just, just to make sure we are not conflicting with each other and not stepping on each other's toes or just giving a, giving an update. Again, both Scrum and Kanban. Then demo. I have Scrum and Kanban with a with a question mark. So if you do Scrum, if you do those circles, it's very useful to do demo in the end where you can just present the work you did, try to sell it to even if, if you're in a company to your product owner or if you're in a community maybe to yourself or just like see what basically happened. In Kanban this can be done and I think it's encouraged but it wouldn't be like probably on a schedule you could do it like anytime you think it makes sense for example. So I think it's optional. I think it's up to you. And then there is retrospective. And this is basically talking about the way you work, but it's not about what you did, how you write. I don't know, like what you did, how... It's not about the thing you're producing, it's about the way you work. So, for example, how you do the stand-ups and how you do anything. It's mostly about the process and you can just like think about how you could improve and you can also do it periodically and this helps the team um, be more effective or just be more natural in the processes and things like this. Um, then I have a section, if you can do this in open source communities, because I was talking about cycles and committing work and it sounds a little bit pressuring and I only have one slide, but basically teams of employees versus teams of volunteers. And this doesn't need to be employees, it could be like people that are probably paid for their work and just like doing this full time versus team of volunteers that are just doing it whenever they have time, right? And what I personally see, that it might be difficult to do Scrum with the cycles, with communities, because people would be doing it just like on their schedule, right? Like, whenever they want. And I personally think that Kanban is the way to go, and that's what we did, and that's what I want to show you as well. But this is the thing to consider, right? If you also Google Scrum or Kanban, this will be mostly applied to like the professional teams that just have the time and resources to put 100% of it. 
So this is a thing you need to, I think, keep in mind. But let me show you the federal doc documentation example. So we published a new federal documentation last week, and I think we were using something like Kanban to organize the work and just figuring out what even we want to do. And I have a board I want to walk you through. Oh, second mic works. So, so this is Fedora Taiga, and I hope you can see it well. I can try to make it a little bit bigger. And that's what we used for planning and tracking the work. And it's also important to point out that this were like group of people. I think there were three people working on this. If you if you're an individual contributor, you have your own project. This might this might not be that important because you can just like work on yourself, just know about everything. But this is very important for communication between people. So I have a few views here, and I think Epics is Epics and Kanban are the most to, most important too. So Epics, these are the goals we have, and then Kanban is the place we use for useful work. So Epix we would use for planning and prioritizing and maybe the grooming. And this is what we use for for actual work. And in the Epix we have defined some goals. So for example the very first goal I defined here was translations. And then we have docs for the docs, like a documentation about the documentation, a web UI, information architecture and things like this. So if I for example open the the translations. There is a description that basically describes the end result. So what we want to do, or what, what, in, in what state we need to be for this to be finished, for this to be considered finished, right? And these are things like we need to be able to submit the original content for translation, probably build the site with the translation and things like this. And I also have an out of scope here that we don't need automated build pipeline with this because that would be too much. So this somehow sets the expectations and if you know this, even maybe a new team member looking at this and maybe the actual state could figure out like what to do because they don't have to think about the whole, whole picture. And we have some cards here that are like develop a script to load the English language to the translation engine just like a script that takes it out and the UI to switch switch the website. And these are actions that are just getting us closer to this goal. And we don't have to define everything. We can just define something, do it, and then see what's going to happen. Also, one nice thing here is that you don't need to have only cars with like that produce work, but you can also have so-called spikes which are like a research cards. So for example, I don't know how this translation engine works. So how, how can I even plan my work? But that's not a problem. I have this and I have my goal. So I can create a card, for example, about figure out how this translation engine works and document it. And based on this, you can create more cards. And this is just one thing. And this is the one goal with those cards and you can basically iterate to get to that closer. I don't know, one, one more example would be, for example, onboarding existing contributors. And I think one of the first cards here would normally be figure out who these people are, but we knew, so we just created a card for each group and then we can track, like, who knows. And again, this is the definition, what does it mean that they know? So we, we can decide at some point that this has been done and no, no other work needs to be completed. So this is where we define our goals and also define some actions that need to be taken to get closer to the goal. I was also thinking about issue and we have a separate issue tracker that is available for everyone. So they can submit feedback, bugs and whatever, but it's a separate thing. And I think it would be nice to in, somehow include it in here, like integrate it with, for example, Pagar, which is a Git with issue tracker we use. But I, I think that's for layers. And so 
this was the planning phase and just like figuring out what we want to do. And if we, if I want to work on something, I can do. Yeah, yeah? this question. Mm -hmm. the oh, that's a very good. That's a very good question. So the question was, who is creating the cards or these epics? So it depends in which environment you work on. For example, I work in team with Red Hat, and what we would do is that these epics would be created out of our requirements. For example, from product management, so they would say that they need a web UI or they would say they need the translations and they would specify what that probably means, right? And then the implementation team could just approach this and say, oh, and I, I can, by the way, just like view it like, like this, that probably to achieve translations, we need to develop the script and we need to develop this another script and the UI. So this is a way how your product owner can tell you not what to do, but what to achieve. And it's up to you to figure out what you need to do to get to that goal, which I think is a very important distinction. So, yeah, good, thank you. So when you know this, you can go to the Kanban view, at least here in Taiga, and you can use any tool you want. I, actually, I'm trying to just present the concepts and like w what we do. But in Taiga is this Kanban view, and we have these columns, and these are basically different states for the cards. And right now we have uh, something called backlog, to do, in progress, testing, the blocked or waiting, done, and there is archives. And these states are, in this case, defined by, uh, by us, because that's how we can organize our work most effectively. And so what, what's this backlog and to do? So in backlog, there are all the cards we basically have. And we treat it in a way that anyone can create a card and then the team can just go through the card and that's, well, that's, that's called the grooming. And for example, clarify what does it mean, maybe tweak it a little bit and make sure that everyone understands. And then you can move it to the to-do, which means that, yeah, you as a team agree that you want to do it and it's scheduled for doing it and you can just pick it up and go. So that's what the to-do is. There's the column you can just go and take some work. So I could say I just want to figure out where to publish some UI bundle. If I don't know, I can just go to the details, that's not important. And if I want to work on it, I would just move it to in progress. This is important in teams that have like many people because that's the way you can communicate what you're doing and you're not just stepping on each other's toes. If I need testing, I can have testing. And this basically, the distinction here is that I can see what's done, but not like ready to be used. And you don't need to have this testing column. I think I have created it like uh, last week just for the deployment and might get rid of it again. I don't know. But this is completely up to you. We have blocked waiting. So for example, I need to validate a design with the design team because I have created a home page that looked like in semi horrible way and I needed someone from the design to say either it's okay or just tweak it and say it's nice. So can this I, is not work. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, how do we uh, prioritize merge testing tasks or some merge to mm -hmm. tasks? Oh, that's an excellent question. How do we prioritize? Yeah. So let, let me finish explaining this column and I'll just go back, okay? So, yeah, the block is basically work that's being done, but not by us. And in Kanban, this might be useful, so you can see like who's got time and not, because for example, I'm not doing any work for this, but it's being worked on by someone else, so I just like track it here, and I'm responsible for delivering. Um, how do I know, that was the question, how do I know what to pick? So that's one of the things, and thank you, that was a good question. I basically miss, missed that before. During the grooming session, you would normally, with your team, go through these to-do cards and you would somehow prioritize them. So for example, if I think that this is much more important than this, I can just move it up and I think it's even true, so I'll just do it. And you don't have to always pick the top one. It's up to you because you're like an intelligent person and you just know what you want to do. You know what you 
want to know, but you should know that, like, at least that's how we work, that near the top are the most priority ones and just near the bottom are, like, not the priority ones. But this is just the guideline. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, whatever you decide. <laughs> what we were even trying to do would be, like, a third column with, like, a priority task. So we had many things we could do, right? And not everything was needed for the deployment that we did last week. So we would have a, another column with things that needs to be done before we can deploy. So I could just like create a new column, just use it for a week or so, or just a month. It was actually several months. And then you can just remove it. It's very flexible. Yeah, I have a question here. So could you do this, for example, with Pegger issues or on GitHub or using Parzilla? Very or good question. What are the advantages of using yeah. Pegger? So if I could, the question was if I could do it with hacker issues or Bugzilla or there's even board somewhere else. So I think you could, and this is not meant to be saying that use Taiga, which is the agile tool, that's definitely not true. But what I see that it's important, at least from my perspective, to separate the issues which are feedback from your users from the task and goals you actually plan yourself because all in this board is created by the team, no one else. So we know what's in there and we can write it in a way, we, in kind of consistent way. So we make these cards like maybe similar sizes or just in a way that we understand and we know it's actionable and it has an end result. On the other hand, if you have issues, they are submitted by users that are not part of your team maybe, and they can submit anything. It could be just like, this is broken, or could you do this, or can we discuss this? And it, it's very unstructured information. So what I think would like the most, if I would have this issue tracker like separately, and then maybe either pulling issues from it, or create a new task in here. It's mostly conceptual, but but yeah, you, you could definitely use any tool, shorter way, you could use any tool, but I think separating those three things, those goals, cards, and then issues is, is useful. Yeah? yeah uh, maybe you'll talk about this later, but uh, one thing I, I don't really understand is so you get an issue, and I mean, do you need to create an epic for it and then create like a, mm -hmm. a one task if you know that it's basically like business as usual, you know basically you right. just do this small stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because I mean that's what we usually do. I mean, okay, we like like we have like one hundred cards and ninety of them is just very simple stuff uh, which doesn't need like any trigger, it's just right. like a one issue. That's a very good question. And you have like 20 things which require several steps, and then I understand this because it's really important to like break it down into like multiple pieces, etc. Mm -hmm. That's a project uh, on its own. But most of the stuff we use mm -hmm. is okay. Like business as usual, you just fetch it, you just do that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question was that if I, for example, get an issue, if I need to create an epic and a card for it, and definitely no, this is just a tool for communicating. If you can work like with this, and for example with your issue tracker, fine, just, just continue doing it, that's absolutely fine. I mean, you also don't have to have all your cards under an epic. That's, I, I think there is a filter which somehow works. And yeah, I can filter by epic and there is not in an epic, and we have some like this. So, I just need to put it this. Yeah, so we have some cards that are not in an epic because these are just like random things we need to do. And maybe they are not like accomplishing like goal or they are, but they are not big enough that we need to figure out or make it complicated. This is also not meant to meant to document everything you do in a huge detail. This is meant to help you as a communication tool. So like if you can do without this, it's absolutely great. Basically, like for one person, you just don't need to do it if you have a like, good memory and good imagination, right? But whatever works to you, you don't even need to use those epics. But for me personally, it helped me with organizing the work and focusing on on those separate things. And if I need to create like more work, I can say, yeah, I need to prioritize translations so I can look this. And now I have this con just this context of translations, and I can focus on that. But whatever works for you. Yeah. So 
So I inherited a Kanban board from, actually it's two project leaders before me on for the for our lunch team. And I'm noticing different titles for the columns of the cards. Mm -hmm. Is there any convention for the names of the different columns that mm -hmm. work in your cards? So the question is basically if there is a convention for these columns. And I think there are three basic columns that most projects will use, and it's like to do, in progress, and done. But you basically do whatever works for your team, right? If I had just a few issues, I don't think I would have to distinguish between backlog and to do, but we could, because we have so much stuff, and I sometimes just think about, I still use the translations, but I think about translation, just like I have an idea, oh, I need to do this so I can just create the card, but it doesn't mean someone needs to work on it, they just worry about it, so that's why I put it in the backlog. Um, also, testing, some work doesn't require testing, for example, we did without testing for like a month or two, but when we were converting the content from the old way to the new way, we actually had to test it, so I just created the column, but I, I'm pretty confident I can just delete it right now. So. I think whatever works for the team or whatever states you need to do. Um, also, if you have like an infrastructure board, you could have even connected it with like the issues as I described in a way that all the user requests, issues or whatever would just end up in one column. It could be even before this and it would be then prioritizing and planning them or whatever. Like you can basically do whatever works for you. Like, I hope that answered the question, it wasn't too fuzzy. Yeah, cool. Right, I think I was describing the columns before we started with the questions, and I think I ended here, but yeah, block waiting, it's a work that's being done, but not by me, and this is done, work that's done. Um, you can see faces here and names, so these are the assignees for the car. And these are not necessarily people who are doing the work, but these are people who are responsible for the work. And that's a very different distinction. So, for example, Brian here is probably responsible for CI for stage. And it doesn't mean he needs to do it, but if someone else does it, Brian needs to just like keep poking him, it's, it's right. Also, if you have people with multiple teams, uh, sorry, multiple people, Teams with multiple people, which is basically the definition of team. Um, you can have five people working on a car, but there will be only one owner. So they're just not like arguing or just like it's. You always have one person that's like responsible for, for example, updating the car and making sure that work is being done the right way. Does it make sense? Like the people who work versus owners? Maybe one yeah. clarification. What about backlog? Backlog, uh, you don't have to sign people. So backlog here doesn't have assigned people. Um, so what would usually happen is that in progress, everything needs to have an assigned people. And from here to the back, to the right, like it must, right? In to-do and backlog, you don't have to have assigned people. That means like anyone can pick it up. But I can also see that, for example, this will be work that only I can do, so I can just assign it to myself and I can somehow I can even do it right now because that's probably me doing it. And now anyone else on the team can see that, oh, this is assigned, so I don't even have to worry about it. But this is free, so I can take it, right? And I think I'm finished with my demo. One, so one, one thing that I guess from my observations of watching this process at work and then also having seen how community teams work, and I think probably many people here have experienced the same thing, which is often you get issues that you don't know what to do or it's maybe it asks for one thing, but mm -hmm. really what that represents is a much bigger thing underneath. Mm -hmm. And so the, one of the most powerful things I think that this method gives you is in creating that backlog because the movement from backlog to to do means something it means we're not sure what this represents yet we're not sure yet we agree what it means or what work needs to be done mm -hmm. moving from that to to do means now everybody understands everything that needs to be done now now you actually have something that's actionable and that's almost like in itself even if nothing else worked right, that in itself would be mm -hmm. amazing for a lot of 
a lot of different teams because you know, we, we have many times these discussions and we have a general consensus but no one writes it down or we agree on a way to go but there was one person who didn't get to weigh in and so mm -hmm. having that having that step it kind of enforces clarity without enforcing in a bad way it's mm -hmm. in a good way that everybody can benefit from mm -hmm. yeah so yeah note was that if we have this call the backlog and the and the to do that sometimes we get issues that are too ambiguous or we are not sure what to do with these so the move from backlog to to do where we can clarify and just make sure that we know what to do is somehow good and i think i, I do it with my personal task management so for example i have an inbox for like random thoughts and i just like can think about something about just like write it down. It can be complete nonsense. And then I would do my personal grooming and I would go through these and just like, so what did I mean by this? Oh, it means I need to do this or I mean need, I need to achieve this or I can do this in like two minutes or just do it right now. And I, I think, yeah, that, that's a very important distinction between just like the ideas or just like rough notes and actual nicely sculpted actionables. Yeah. I was just going to add, from a community perspective, we've been lucky to have Adam's time on the stock shoot, uh, and my face was up there. But like, not a lot of my time has been able to be dedicated to this because blah. So uh, last week when we were doing the rollout, it was super helpful to have this Kanban board because I had basically disappeared for two weeks and had not really spoken to Adam and kept up at all. And then when the rollout came out, there's all these cards, and I could just go through and spend my time moving things from to do to in progress to testing to done. And we were able to work together, even though I'm essentially an episodic you know, contributor. I, I don't have time in my day job to go do this, but we were able to make this happen uh, from a very community perspective. You don't need to be 40 hours a week in order to participate in a Kanban situation. Yeah, that was a great note by Brian. So yeah, yeah, the way we have it set up, so you have like those epics and the cards, it's good if you, for example, go out for a while and then you come back and you don't talk to people from the team, but you kind of know what needs to be done, so it's, it's organized. And I would add to this that if you, for example, onboard a new person, or actually in the open source world, there is just like a person who wants to discover what's done in this project, they can just see the epics and, oh, they are trying to do a UI, that's not my thing. Oh, they are trying to do translation. Great. So I can just have a look what needs to be done in the translation. So I can see like the definition of done. Yeah, I, I think I could achieve that. I can see these actions. I can do one or just create one. I think it's much easier to onboard or just like for people that are not 100% following the project all the time. I think it's very easy to just like leave and then just continue the work. Yeah, I, I think we should finish. So let me just close with this. It's just agile is not like the agile. I don't think you can get certified in Agile. I don't think you can do Agile, but you can adopt Agile principles to your way of work. So you can iterate, so you can just like do smaller circles. And I think it's important to distinguish between those three, between your goals, between your actions that get you closer to the goals, and between issues that are just user feedback. And with this, thank you.